I want to talk about making an old brain young. Actually, what I really want to tell you is that um, years ago now, my grandmother uh, had a terrible stroke. And this was when I was just beginning college. And I used to go home and visit her. And she was really completely paralyzed on the right side of her body and also had some speech impairment. And at that time, really, nobody could do anything for her. Perhaps because I was haunted by that terrible uh, incident with her, I became a neuroscientist. And I was captivated by how the brain wires itself during development, and particularly how it is uh, and why it is that the child's brain seems like such an amazing sponge, and it's so easy for children to learn languages and other things, whereas it's so difficult for us, particularly me, to learn French without an accent as an adult. And it occurred to me that if only we could understand the underlying cell and molecular mechanisms that regulate these critical periods, these early amazing sponge periods of development of the brain, maybe we could actually turn them back on in adulthood in aid of recovery uh, from stroke, uh, or maybe even cognitive enhancement, or maybe I could learn how to speak French without an accent. So what is a critical developmental period? Well, you know it just by experience. Language is a perfect example of such a period. It's really easy to learn one, two, three, even four languages as a child. You, of course, can learn language as an adult, but the quality of learning is very different. And also, it's really hard to learn the language without an accent. So a critical period is a period during life when experience and brain circuit tuning is happening, and when it's only during that time that you can learn perfectly a certain skill. And of course, as I said, afterwards, you can still learn. So how would you discover the underlying cell and molecular mechanisms for developmental critical periods? And the answer really is, you're not going to do it uh, you know, as far as I know, mice haven't learned how to speak uh, French, but as an animal model, mice are wonderful animal models. And like us, mice have two eyes, and in fact, they have to somehow, the brain has to learn how to use those two eyes together uh, during a developmental critical period. So, if you've thought about it ever, have you ever wondered why it is that we only have a single view of the world, even though we have two eyes, and both eyes are sending separate, independent views of the world to the brain. And yet, we only see one world, unless there's some kind of pathology. And the reason for that is in the brain wiring itself. And you can see that actually happening in the first few steps of visual information processing as the eyes send their connections to the brain. So, for example, you can see that individual eyes send their connections to one side of the brain, also to the other side. And the first set of information processing, those connections are kind of lined up in a set of rows, right eye, left eye. And then there's a really important handoff here, and that handoff then sends information to the next step in the pathway, which is the primary visual cortex. Now, I want to say something important about the handoff first. What I want to tell you is that the handoff is something very special. It's called a synapse, or a junction. And that's where the information from one nerve cell comes to an end and then is transferred to the next cell along the road. So the synapse is composed of the end of one nerve cell and the beginning of the other, and that's actually where drugs of abuse work, for example. And remember this, because you are your synapses. And what do I mean by that? I mean that learning happens at synapses, and synapses change with learning. Memories are stored at synapses, and, and, and sadly, synapses are lost in diseases like Alzheimer's disease, where synapses are pruned away. Now, 
If we follow the connections from the LGN, from this relay station up to the primary visual cortex, you'll notice another really cool thing has happened to the connections. They started out separately in the eyes, but in the cortex, you'll notice that the inputs from the two eyes are interdigitated with each other. Right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye. Red, green, red, green. And this beautiful interdigitation then allows right eye to meet left eye by connecting with a common neuron, creating a binocular neuron, and this is the first time in the visual system that nerve cells get input from both eyes. And this is where this seeing happens, where you create this single view of the world coming from both eyes, and it's important because it gives us the ability to have bi binocular depth perception. Now, it's possible to visualize these connections in real life by labeling the connections, let's say from the green eye with a white tracer, and then you can actually see those connections in the primary visual cortex. Let's say we're looking down, and you can see these beautiful stripes of white, black, white, black, right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye. You can see these stripes. And at this scale, you can see that every little dot, which is the size of one of these synapses, is, um, you can see it in relation to these things, which are these grains of rice. So at that scale, you're looking at really hundreds of thousands of synapses, and what's so remarkable is that they're separated from each other quite beautifully into right eye and left eye stripes. 50-50 even, Stephen. So when these stripes were first observed by David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel, who later got the Nobel Prize for their work, everybody thought they have to be hardwired in, they couldn't be left to chance because they were just so perfectly organized. But Hubel and Wiesel were very interested in understanding the mechanisms of congenital cataract in children. So when children are born with a congenital cataract and they're blind in that eye, if the cataract is not removed promptly, they will never see through that eye. And when Hubel and Wiesel made an animal model by just patching one eye and then checking the inputs from the open eye, to the visual cortex using the white tracer, amazingly, they saw that the open eye had taken over almost all of the cortical circuitry for vision, leaving pitiful black holes for the closed eye, not enough to support vision. And this was a really major finding because it shows that experience is required for wiring and tuning up brain circuits. And it's really a use it or lose it thing, and this is a very vivid example of the use it or lose it thing. By the way, this is also a really nice example of synapse plasticity. You know, the kind of thing that when you play brain games, people are talking about your brain plasticity. This is synapse plasticity in action, and it's really this um, takeover of uh, cortical circuitry according to use. Now, the other interesting thing is you know perfectly well if your grandmother, my grandmother Sonia, gets a cataract, then if she's had normal vision her whole life, and even if she has a cataract for a long period of time, if it's corrected by putting a nice new clear, clear lens, she can see fine. So what's different between the child and grandma? And the difference is that these changes for brain wiring only happen during a critical period of development for vision. So this is another great example of a critical period. And once these circuits are formed and these beautiful stripes are formed, they become stable and they, they don't, they're no longer susceptible to change with experience, which is a good thing because we don't want all our, brain, all our synapses changing all the time um, in that kind of global way. Now, what's actually going on with this synapse plasticity during this developmental critical period. Well, some of you may know that as babies, we're actually born with more synapses than we have in adulthood. And in fact, during critical periods of development, some synapses are selected and stabilized with use, so they're actually really important targets of use, and others, if they're not used, are actually pruned away and removed. And synapses are necessary for learning and memory. So this pruning process really allows us to have stable circuits as adults. And as I said, we can still learn, but this kind of pruning doesn't happen in this wholesale way in adulthood. So wouldn't it be amazing if we could somehow revert the brain 
to be able to restore the set of synapses to this more childlike state where there may be even more of these synapses. If we could only understand these mechanisms for pruning and stabilization of synapses, maybe we could do that. And I want to make a long story short by saying that, in fact, it's possible to identify some molecular mechanisms that can seem to control this pruning process. And one way we did this was to raise mice for a brief period of time in the dark so they couldn't see, and then look for genes that are turned on or off by vision. And we found a candidate, which we're kind of excited about, but it's a big mouthful. It's called paired immunoglobulin-like B. I'm going to just call it peer B. And we found this in this kind of screen, looking for these molecules. And just remember that the R in peer B stands for receptor. I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, how would you prove that this particular molecule is needed for synapse pruning or for synapse plasticity? Well, one way to do it is to actually remove the function of the molecule. And that can be done in mice by genetically engineering a mouse that grows up with all of its genes except for the pure B gene. And then scientists can look and see what happens. And when we made that kind of experiment, we figured that knocking out this pure B gene would mean there would be no brain plasticity. So if we somehow measured brain plasticity, by like, measuring the amount of takeover of the cortex, the white area, we should see normally there'd be some takeover in the mouse, but in the pure B knockout mouse, there would be no takeover whatsoever, no plasticity. So we were incredibly surprised to discover in these pure B knockout mice that there was actually more plasticity than normal, not less. And not only that, but very optimistic for me in learning French as an adult, we discovered that even in the adult, there was some plasticity left. And in fact, that plasticity, um, it, it wasn't as much as in, uh, in development, but promising, it was sort of promising. Because remember, normally the critical period closes, and then if you patch one eye in a mouse, you don't see any uh, expansion of the other eye. But here's a mouse that still has expansion. So what, how is this working? We need to understand how is it working. And so one idea might be, you actually know the answer, really, because I told you. It might be, maybe, the number of synapses are different in the peer B knockout mice than in normal mice that grew up with peer B. So we did an experiment where we simply counted on our favorite nerve cells in the visual cortex. We counted the synapses. And in this case, we counted the little knobs that are on the synapse, that are on the nerve cells, and those are the post synapse, so we counted them. And lo and behold, what we discovered is that there were many more of these synapses, which really are the sites for plasticity in the pure B knockout mice than in the normal mice that grew up with pure B. And not only that, but there were more of those synapses present in the adult mouse brain in the pure B knockout mice as well. So that's kind of exciting, and the question really is. Do we actually know enough to make a pill <laughs> at this point, right? And could I take the pill and could I learn French finally without an accent? So the answer is really ki is kind of promising. Because remember, I told you about the um, R in peer B. So the R in peer B is for receptor. And receptors are really quite favorite molecules for uh, drug companies and, and big pharma because it's possible to target a receptor and block its function. So certainly we're not going to do in genetic engineering on me, at least not on me, anytime soon. So we want to really make a pill using the knowledge. And receptors are molecules that transmit information from the outside of a cell to the inside of a cell to do work. In this case, the peer B receptor is transmitting information about from these yellow ligands on the outside of the cell, and that's driving this pruning system signal to get, rid of, um, to get rid of synapses. So we can make a pill, in fact, we can make a little protopill based on our knowledge of peer B structure, and we can actually block this signaling, and, 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 and instead of genetically engineering, we can prevent the peer B receptor from working. And then we can give this protopill to the mouse, and we can ask what happens to plasticity in the mouse brain and what happens to the synapses in the mouse brain. And amazingly, we really didn't expect this to work, but what we discovered is 
that just like in the genetically engineered mouse, but now we give it to the adult mouse uh, acutely, just for a few days, for seven days, and we suddenly find that, we, that new synapses and more of these spines appear in the brain of the adult mouse. So this is extremely promising, and by the way, this also comes along with more plasticity in, as we can measure it in the adult mouse brain. So when we discovered this, if my grandmother was only here now, she would have said to me, Carla, I want this pill as soon as possible. And, um, you know, I probably would have said, yeah, great idea, Grandma, but not so fast. Because let's think about this a minute. We don't know really how this pill works. What if you took this pill, and in addition to creating new synapses where new learning can occur, what if you also lost the synapses you already have where old memories reside? So we got to do more work on this pill. And remember, it's just in a mouse. It's not actually in... <laughs> it's not for us yet. It's not ready for prime time yet. But I think the message that I've learned from these experiments is that the adult brain, whether it's a mouse or a human, has more plasticity in it than is normally used. And some of the plasticity is braked and is available under the right circumstances to be recruited for th things like brain uh, repair of the brain after injury, or possibly even maybe it could be used in treating and curing Alzheimer's disease by putting back synapses for new memories. And all I can say is, Grandma, I just wish you were with us now because maybe there would be something more for you. Thank you. Thank you.